This week on The Gadget Show, is this the best camcorder ever made? What better way to find out than for the entire Gadget Show team to jump off a mountain? And I fly to Chicago and visit Nextfest, a technology show straight out of the future, complete with invisibility cloaks, a dolphin boat and the best video game I've ever seen. <laughs> By April, Sky will be broadcasting cinema-quality, high-definition television with all other broadcasters following suit in the years to come. But right now, if you've got a high-def telly, the easiest way of seeing any high-definition pictures on it is to shoot them yourself. Think about it. There's virtually no broadcast HD telly yet, and you won't find a high-def DVD at your local rental store. But with this Sony camcorder HD, it's easy to film your own high-definition movies. This, the HC1, is a little revolution. It's the smallest and lightest high-definition camcorder in the world. For just over £1,100, Sony promised professional quality on Commonal Garden Mini DV tapes. It sounds like the best camcorder ever, but is it? Well, we've decided to put it to an extreme test. The Gadget Show team are going paragliding yeah, yeah, yeah. to see if such a small camera can really produce proper high-definition pictures. We're comparing it to a semi-professional high-def camera from JVC, costing four grand. And to see whether it's just high-def hype, we're also going to compare it to our favourite standard DV camcorder, the Panasonic GS250. I'm handing the high-def Sony over to John to test because he's in the market for a new camcorder. Jason's providing the benchmark high-def pics on the JVC, and I'm going to be using the standard DV Panasonic. Now, high definition is so exciting because whereas normal television has 576 visible horizontal lines, high definition pictures have more, so there's much more detail for the eyes to feast on. This is the bit I wanted to get right. That's it. I can run in this one. Yeah. Ooh, lovely. Right, Susie. Right, Jace. <laughs> film Jason, film John, film myself, and talk about the camera and land safely. It's a piece of cake. After three. One, two, three. Gliding is the perfect environment in which to test our camcorders. The flight will last just a few minutes, so if any of them are too tricky to use, we'll miss all the magic moments. We've got fantastic views to film, so we can see which camcorders record the most detail and which can zoom into features the best. And finally, the producers asked us to film ourselves, and that's going to be impossible if these things are too cumbersome to handle. Right, me first with the standard DV. There's Jace, John over there, with the high definition cameras. Wow, DV cams just seem to keep getting better and better. This Panasonic costs about £700 and it's so light, it's unbelievable. It's quite tiny, but the best thing about it is it's so simple to use. The controls are literally at your fingertips. You've got a 10 times zoom, that's Jace. Uh, with stabilizers, so the picture should be pretty good. Three separate CCD chips for green, red, and blue, so the colors should also be great. The little screen that flips out, maybe that's slightly flimsy, but then again, not everybody's uh, paragliding the first time they try out a camcorder, are they? Gotta say, this is absolutely amazing. So, the Panasonic set a pretty high benchmark. Can the high def cameras really be any better? Over to John. This Sony is a bit bigger than the Panasonic. It weighs about 600 grams, but it's still small enough that you wouldn't say no to taking it on holiday. Feels very well made as well. You can also record footage as DV, play it back as DV. You can even take HDV footage and output it from the camera as DV, so it's more backwardly compatible than you could possibly imagine. Frankly, to use it, you wouldn't think it was much different from any other camcorder. Whether it's worth the extra money is all down to the quality of the shots, which we'll see when we get back down.
So here we are, launched over the Welsh countryside. It's so peaceful up here, not at all the adrenaline rush that I expected. On this uh, JVC semi-professional high-def camcorder, I reckon pretty well equipped for the job. It's very sturdy. It'll probably uh, survive an impact from this height, but I've got to save the harness just in case. It's relatively heavy, it's three kilograms four times heavier than the uh, Sony, six times heavier than the Panasonic. What it's good at though, is hopefully providing me with a nice steady shot. I can show you just how stable this JVC camera is. And of course the high def setting that I've got it on should provide a really nice picture quality. But the battery consumption on this camera though is appalling. There's a camera battery, I think signing out. Jace landing down there. Speedy Gonzales. Three lovely landings. Absolutely superb. I've got to say, this camera on the shoulder, really, really supportive. It's also very intuitive on the controls for the zoom and so on, but a little bit unwieldy. That was absolutely incredible. Great fun. This camera, this Panasonic, it's just so easy to use. Well, that was rather exciting stuff. I think I'll do this again. Thank you, Glyn. Uh, yeah, looking at the stuff back, it looks, uh, looks pretty good already, actually. Hmm. As our pilots packed away the paragliders, we got on with reviewing the footage so we could answer the big question, is it really worth splashing out on a high-definition camera? Obviously, we can't show you true high-def pictures because the gadget show is still broadcast in standard definition. But line up the same shot on all three camcorders and you can definitely see a difference. In third place was the standard definition Panasonic, although for normal mini DV, the picture quality was excellent. Amazingly, the four grand JVC's pictures were only slightly better. A bit poor, we think, for a camera aimed at professionals. But without question, the neat little high definition Sony was our winner, giving us by far the best pictures. When we watched the footage back on a high def telly, the detail was superb. The colours fantastic, and all for little more than the cost of a normal top-end camcorder. So if you can afford £1,100, then without doubt, this should be your next camcorder. Certainly John was convinced and bought himself one the very next day. He paid £1,155, but check out the net as prices are dropping all the time. This is Chicago, and I've come here with my trusty camcorder to capture a gadget exhibition that's about as cutting edge as it gets. The halls behind me are stuffed to brimming with the kind of technological innovations that make a gadget freak like myself go weak at the knees. This is Wired's Next Fest, and believe me, you're gonna love it. The idea behind Wired's Next Fest is to put the future on the show, and I reckon they've done a pretty good job. I've been around the world for the gadget show, tracking down new technology to show you, but my three days at Next Fest turned up more than all those previous trips combined. As soon as I got in through the doors, it was apparent that a big theme this year was video games. And most of my first morning at the show was spent hogging what has to be the best interface ever for a fighting game. This is Kick-Ass Kung Fu, and it's what's called an immersive video game. As well as projecting an image of you into the game using blue screen technology, the computer also monitors your movements so that you can react in real time with virtual characters. You see what's going on on two large screens each side of you, but the best bit is that the computer exaggerates your movements, so a small hop becomes a fantastically stylish leap five foot off the ground, turning a skinny geek like me into a ferocious kung fu fighting master. 
Research has shown that girls are not big fans of confrontational video games and prefer something a little more friendly. To that end, Dublin City University have come up with this collaborative balloon game. You all sit round a table and blow into the controllers, working as a team to guide the balloon where it needs to go. Of course, as soon as six men started playing, a fight almost broke out. All the video games I saw at NextFest had disposed of the traditional control pad and created interfaces offering a much more sensory experience. This, for example, is Virtual, a digital rocking horse that you can ride across a virtual landscape. You change direction by turning his head, and rocking faster makes him move more quickly towards your eventual goal, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. A bit trippy, maybe, but the freakiest game at this show had to be this one. You're about to win it's a game called Brain Ball. It's me versus Tiffany. And essentially, whoever is the most chilled out between me and Tiffany will win the game. If I'm calmer, the ball will roll to her. If she's calmer, it will roll to me. <laughs> Using these kind of futuristic McEnroe-style headbands that measure our brain waves. High-tech stuff. You ready? Okay, let's go. There you have it, categoric proof that I am as cool on the inside as I am on the outside. <laughs> if a game that actually gets inside your head seems a little much, then how about one that alters reality, turning your garden, your house, or even your whole town into a playing area? We're showing an invention we call Human Pac-Man, and with Human Pac-Man it's a social and physical game where the people actually become the Pac-Man and the ghosts and play together in the real world. The technology is called augmented reality. It uses infrared, GPS and inertial sensors to track the player's movements. Then it can superimpose computer-generated objects, in this case the cookies that Pac-Man's trying to collect, over our view of the real world. It's a staggering concept, and the best bit is, it actually works. Finally, I found these intelligent paving slabs, which sense your movements and race around you to meet your next step. They're prototypes, but when fully realised, will mean you can walk or run anywhere in a virtual world without actually moving an inch. Of course, Next Fest isn't just about games, so stick around to see the dolphin boat, the incredible fog screen, some pretty impressive robotics, and my veins. More and more of us now have a digital music collection stored on an MP3 player or computer hard drive. But what if you don't fancy listening through headphones or sitting in front of tinny computer speakers? How do you stream music around your home? For about £30, you can pick up a little FM transmitter which fits onto the top of your iPod and turns it into a little broadcasting station. Tune any FM radio within a 10-foot radius to the right frequency and you'll hear your favourite tunes. There is a downside, though. It's actually illegal. Essentially, you're running a pirate radio station and could face up to two years in prison. You can create a wireless music network using the Apple Airport Express. It costs £89 and is compatible with both Mac and PC, but only works with iTunes. Once you've installed the software that comes with the airport, just plug it into a power socket, connect the cable to the jacks on your stereo, and when you play music on your computer, it'll also come out of your stereo. The only problem is that to change tracks, you constantly have to scurry back to the computer. Spend a little more, though, and there's a way around that, too. The Squeeze Box 2 comes with a remote control, so there's no need to be at your computer to change tracks. It costs around £200 and connects to the existing music collection on your computer via your Wi-Fi network. Plug the box into your Hi-Fi and download the software from the Slim Devices website. There is a downside, however. If you bought your music on iTunes, it isn't compatible. If you want to listen to different music in different rooms at the same time, then the Sonus Digital Music System is for you. Again, it works on your existing Wi-Fi network, and the software that comes with the system will detect your digital music collection. 
Then just install a Sonus box and some speakers for each room you want to stream music to. You can control what's being played in each room from the wireless handset. A three-room system will set you back £1,400 and you can add more boxes into more rooms as and when you want to. This is Tom Dunmore, Editor-in-Chief of Stuff magazine. He's here to tell us what's new in the world of mobile phones. The mobile phone marketplace has been totally revolutionised by the arrival of this slim supermodel here, the Motorola V3 Razor. The V3 is just so much sexier than all the other mobile phones on the market that everybody's got one. But what about if you want something that's a little bit different? Well, how about going for one of the V3's siblings? Now, the Pebble is the more feminine of the two, and its killer feature is a fantastic little eject mechanism there to open it up. But my favourite is the Sliver. This is even thinner than the V3. I really like this. And the killer feature has got to be the inclusion of, underneath this flap, the smallest memory card known to man. That, believe it or not, has got 512 megabytes of memory on it, and by Christmas, that'll double to a gigabyte. And that means something that's small enough to inhale will be able to hold a day's worth of music. Now, Motorola seem to have started an avalanche of stylish phones out there. <laughs> phones like the exquisite Nokia 8800. It's finished in solid steel, and it's quite a weighty phone, which means that this sliding mechanism has a lovely feel to it. It's kind of like a classic Zippo lighter. But if you would rather have brains than style, you could look at the orange SPV. Uh, this is the C550, the latest SPV. As you can see, they've actually added buttons to it that allow you to go directly to access the music and once you're there, to play and pause tracks. So it's a really nice combination of a smartphone and a fun phone. But the most powerful phone that you can buy has to be the O2 XDA Exec. This is a beast of a phone. As you can see, it looks more like a, a pocket computer. It's got a processor that runs at 520 megahertz and has a total of almost 200 megabytes of memory. Also has a video camera built in, it's got Wi-Fi, it's got Bluetooth, it's got pretty much everything that you can ask for. It's a fantastic gadget. But as a phone, I personally would feel a bit of a fool speaking into something this big. So what's the future for mobile phones? Well, they're taking over the home as well. This is the BT Fusion Hub, and it plugs into your landline at home and links to your mobile phone. And that means you can use your mobile to make landline calls. So much cheaper calls when you're at home. But what's really cool is that you can start a conversation using your landline at home and then walk out the door and you should be able to continue that conversation with the phone switching automatically to the mobile networks. How seamless it will be, I don't know, but Jason is testing the system out for real in a couple of weeks on The Gadget Show. Definitely this is the future of mobile phones. London. This is John Simmett. He used to be Dipsy in the Teletubbies, and he's one of Birmingham's top comedians. A few years ago, we had the favourite Dwayne Chambers for the men's 100 metres for the gold medal, representing the UK. And Dwayne, the favourite, ran taking drugs. And running on drugs, Dwayne, the favourite, came in fifth. Which makes you wonder what type of drugs the fool was taking. I'm recording him so that I can help make his humour available round the globe and at the same time prove how easy it is to make your own podcast. Podcasts are the internet's own form of radio. They've been around for barely a year and they're simply an audio file with a web address. So unlike conventional radio, you aren't tied to listening at a particular time. You can download the file and listen to it where and when you want. My name's Adam Curry. Typically between 10 and 20 megabytes, the files are easily transferred to your computer, burnt onto CD or loaded onto your portable music player, hence the pod in podcast. You can even subscribe to regular shows that interest you. They're downloaded automatically to your computer when new editions appear. 
But best of all, because it's internet-based, there's nobody stopping you making your own podcasts. There's no need to convince some radio executive you've got something to say. There's no need to satisfy the demands of a broadcasting regulator. You're free to talk to the world. I'm worrying about what's going to happen about Michael Jackson. I do have to say, a master stroke by his legal team. One of the character witnesses they were going to call to tell you what he saw in Michael's life. They had Stevie Wonder. Mr. Wonder, take the stand. Stevie, what did you see? Absolutely nothing. Case dismissed. Thousands of people have already made their own podcasts. Now, originally, it was a pretty geeky thing to do, hence the large number that are on technology subjects. Here's a brilliant one I can thoroughly recommend. The MacCast. For Mac geeks, by Mac geeks. But now the big players are getting in on the act. The latest edition of Apple's iTunes has a special podcast section with a chart of the most downloaded shows, and they're all free. And the BBC's podcasts are a big hit, with thousands downloading everything from the Today programme to Chris Boyles. But in spite of the big guns getting involved, this is still, above all, do-it-yourself radio. So how do you do it? Well, to start with, you need to record your sound. Virtually all computers can be turned into sound recorders, and there's an excellent bit of free recording software available called Audacity. Plug a microphone into the socket and away you go. You can uh, press play, pause and record just as if you were using a conventional tape recorder. And there's a constant visual monitoring of the sound so you can see what you're recording with these mesmerising squiggly lines. I'm recording in high-quality, uncompressed stereo. And by the end of the session, I had 45 minutes, or 500 megabytes, of material. But don't worry if you want to record sound on location and you don't have a laptop. There are some excellent pocket-sized digital sound recorders available. This Maycom comes with a separate microphone pre-amplifier, all for around 200 quid. Plug in a decent microphone and you get impressive sound quality. By recording complete, I can now use the same free program, Audacity, to edit down my 45 minutes of material. There's a nice run through quite a section of jokes here, so I can select that and cut and paste, just like you would in a word processing program. In the first stage, she's looking for a relationship, we're looking for sex. Let's cut that piece out, open a new track and paste it in. The second stage, we've moved on a bit, she's looking for commitment, we're looking for sex and the same with this view here. And then most people end up in the third and final stage, which is that we're looking for the remote control and a good night's sleep. <laughs> and she's looking for sex. Also, I could add lots of effects if I wanted to. I could, um, I could change the pitch, I could uh, add music, but actually I think I'll keep mine fairly simple. And of course, if the sex is no good, her friends know all about it. So I select the uh, various tracks with my files on and export them as a rough mix. They say a rough mix, but it actually sounds quite good. Leopard print underwear, your handcuffs, you're jumping from the wardrobe just as Tarzan and all that sort of stuff. Though obviously at the moment, the files are still in their full original quality and they'll need to be compressed into a format like MP3 for ease of downloading. A little tip and so on, you know, get her to sign a, a pre-sexual contract as opposed to pre-nuptial. Hmm. Sounds good. Now I need to put my podcast somewhere people can find it. I could submit it to iTunes for publishing. I could link to it from a blog, but I've decided to use the website that I created last series. Bear in mind, though, that if your podcast becomes popular, you'll need to find somewhere that can cope with the demand of all those people downloading it. She'll probably break it, but at least that way you can sue her ass afterwards and make a few pounds out of your ritual humiliation, you know? <laughs> Media experts reckon that in a few years' time, there'll be 80 million people around the world regularly listening to podcasts. So if you want to make your mark in this exciting new medium, now's the time to do it. Biometric recognition is starting to be used in all forms of security, whether it's in identity cards, getting through customs, or even keeping your personal data safe on your own computer. Please look into the mirror. Identification completed. It's all about identifying you by your physical attributes. 
Now, the method that's been around for the longest, over 100 years in fact, is this. Fingerprint recognition, which is a great low-tech solution because the lines and the swirls on the print are easily visible. But as computer technology gets better, we're finding more and more accurate ways to prove that you are who you say you are. And the current favorite is iris recognition, identifying you by looking you straight in the eye. So, how does iris recognition work? Firstly, the scanner takes a photo of your eye with an infrared camera. Infrared because it shows up more detail in dark eyes and it cuts down on reflection from the cornea. That produces a black and white image. Now, once the computer's worked out which bit the iris is, it's of course this very detailed bit around the black circle, the pupil in the middle, it begins something called demodulation, which is a posh way of saying it breaks up the iris into a grid of tiny little chunks. 1,024 little chunks to be precise. Now the software can start the job of identifying individual features in the iris. There's one. There's another. There's a third. There you go. That's a good one. Now, the reason iris recognition is potentially so accurate is because of the detail that's in the eye. Whereas on your fingerprints, you might have a few dozen identifying marks, on your iris, you have a few hundred. Another reason iris recognition could be better than something like fingerprint recognition is that the iris is protected by the eyelid and the cornea, which means it's much less likely to get damaged or to change over time. The computer now holds an accurate map of your eye, complete with a grid reference to where your identifying features should be. When your eye gets scanned again, say when you're trying to gain access to a top secret military installation, the whole process is repeated. The computer tries to compare this new map to the one that it's got on file, and if it can match more than 72% of the features, the door slides open and you're in. Now it's time to return to Chicago to see some more of the amazing technology on display at Wired's Next Fest. If the speed at which technology is moving these days scares you, then this show will have you barricading yourself under the stairs. It's all about showcasing future technology, stuff that may seem mind-blowing now, but will be commonplace before we know it. And if Next Fest's anything to go by, in the future, robots will be everywhere. What is your name? My name is Phil. Where were you born? Phil was born in Chicago. Something I was really looking forward to seeing at the show was this Philip K. Dick android. Built in the form of the famous science fiction writer, this robot promised a lot. The face uses 36 servo motors to mimic muscles. Cameras in the eyes can track faces, recognize facial expressions, and identify people it has in its memory banks. Then that visual data is fused with advanced speech recognition software and speech synthesis software so that the android can hold a full and intelligent conversation, apparently. Your favorite movie is The Bicentennial Man. Is that correct? My favorite movie is The Bicentennial Man. Have you seen The Bicentennial Man? I have. I liked it very much. Why is it your favorite movie? Why is it your favorite movie? I like the giant bugs. The giant bugs? I do not remember giant what bugs. What if it didn't happen? I know what you mean. I forget a lot, too. Ah. Oh, dear. A little way to go yet, I think. Much more impressive was Hubo, a humanoid robot from Korea. Japan has led the way in humanoid robots for a while with Curio and Asimo, but this chap represents the first serious challenge to their dominance. Hubo responds to voice commands, has individually moving fingers, and will soon have a moving face like that on the Philip K. Dick android. But my favorite robot of the show was this little chap, Croino. Just 35 centimeters tall, he uses a new technology called Shinwalk, which allows him to walk very naturally and pull off some pretty clever moves.
gorgeous. And finally, on the subject of robotics, remember Sigourney Weaver fighting aliens wearing a big robotic suit that exaggerated her strength? Well, check this out. It's a real-life power assist suit that does the same sort of thing. As you bend your arms and legs to start lifting, sensors on the suit detect which muscles are being used and activate a battery-powered air pump, which in turn inflates a series of airbags on the suit. As the bags inflate, they provide added muscle power. A lot of what I saw at the show was stuff that until very recently only existed in science fiction movies. For example, this could be the first step on the road to an invisibility cloak. It's a coat made of a special reflective material created by a professor at Tokyo University. A video camera records the real-life scenery behind the subject, transmits that image to a front-mounted projector, which then displays the scene on the reflective coat, making the wearer almost disappear. Early days for invisibility, maybe, but still very impressive. And it looks like we might have X-ray specs soon, too, if this technology is anything to go by. What you're seeing right here projected back onto my skin on my own veins. What's happening is the device above is sending infrared out, which is reacting with the hemoglobin in my skin. That's then being reprocessed and very, very quickly turned into a virtual map of my veins and then projected onto the surface of my skin. It all happens in the blink of an eye and the effect is almost like you're seeing through your arm. Less glamorous, but just as impressive, is this little pill. Even when it's deliberately cracked, it will repair itself because it's made of self-healing polymer. Within the material are microscopic capsules, which release a liquid agent that hardens to repair damage. So in a few hours, the crack in this pill will have healed completely. Imagine what that means for that scratch on your mobile phone. This is something called a fog screen. It uses an ultra-fine layer of vapour that's dropping from this big sieve hung from the ceiling. It's dry to the touch and it'll take an image from any standard projector. Look, I'll show you how it works by walking through it. If I, if I then spin round, you should be able to see me. There I am, waving at you. The effect is quite amazing when you see it in the flesh because you can see what's behind it. Uh, in effect, it's as if your image is just hanging in space. Ad companies are already very interested in the fog screen. They reckon walkthrough advertising hoardings would definitely grab your attention. But yet again, the killer application is something we've already seen in the movies. Remember Tom Cruise and Minority Report? Well, the fog screen also has an interactive add-on, meaning it can be used to operate computers or write and draw in the air. Finally, we come to what must be the coolest toy in the world. How about having your own personal submarine? The inner space dolphin can dive briefly below the surface, as well as performing jumps and barrel rolls. It looks pretty impressive on the stand, but it looks a lot better on the water. It has a 110 horsepower propeller engine and is capable of 30 miles an hour on the surface and 20 under it. It's controlled by changing the pitch of its side and tail fins, mimicking the swimming style of a dolphin. What's really exciting about this thing is it's completely wireless and it's covered in ports into which you can plug all kinds of really... The battery powers two electric motors, so if you want to pick up the pace, you can switch on an electrical assist mode. 